five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Lift off. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Space Business Podcast, where we investigate all the exciting ways in which people participate in the new space economy by conversations with entrepreneurs, executives, investors, and other members of the space family. I'm Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor in and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as investment advice. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist. But I am an alumnus of the International Space University, which is also our partner in the podcast. Here's a short message from them. The International Space University, founded in 1987 in Massachusetts, USA, and now headquartered in Strasbourg, France, is the world's premier international space education institution. It is supported by major space agencies and aerospace organizations, ISU offers the Master of Science in Space Studies program at its central campus in Strasbourg. ISU also conducts the highly acclaimed two months Space Studies program at different host institutions in locations spanning the globe. And more recently implemented the Executive Space Course, the Southern Hemisphere Space Studies program and Commercial Space program. ISU programs are delivered by over 100 ISU faculty members in concert with invited industry and agency experts from institutions around the world. Since its founding, 33 years ago, more than 4,800 students and participants from over 100 countries graduated from ISU. Follow us on social media at ISUNet. Our guest on this episode is Marcos Franceschini, the co-founder and CEO of Californian satellite communication startup Skyloom. Marcos was working on Earth observation satellites in his native Argentina when he realized that most data collected by such satellites is lost and there is not enough downlink capacity to get the data back to Earth. Skyloom hopes to solve this problem by placing a relay satellite in geostationary orbit. In order to do so, Skyloom uses optical communications, in other words, lasers, which has significant advantages over the traditional radio frequency communications. Just for that aspect alone, it is worth listening to him. I give you another reason. SpaceX and Amazon need these types of lasers for their broadband internet constellations. And a third reason. Satellite communications is, and will be in the near future, the biggest subsector of the space industry by revenues. Also, for full transparency, my firm is an investor in Skyloom. Please enjoy my conversation with Marcus. Hi, so we're here today with Marcos Franceschini, the CEO of Skyloom. We're doing this remotely as we're still in the middle of the coronavirus crisis, obviously. Marcos is uh, joining us from Miami and I'm sitting in my European office in Zurich. So welcome, Marcus. Thanks for having me, Rafael. Marcus, why don't you start off as usual on this podcast? Uh, we asked the entrepreneur to give the elevator pitch on the company. Yeah, so... You know, I've been working in the space industry for the last 12, 13 years, developing, so my career started developing geostationary telecommunications satellites. I'm originally from Argentina, where I developed the RSAT-1 and RSAT-2 satellites. And then I moved into systems engineering for Earth observation spacecraft and was part of a team that was developing a high-resolution camera and also a spacecraft. And then I realized that there was a huge imbalance between the imaging capabilities as opposed to downlink capacity. Basically, less than 1% of all the images that the spacecraft could acquire were getting back to the ground. So I figured out that that was a huge inefficiency in the industry today. So, yeah, after working or developing spacecraft in the corporate world for more than 10 years, I quit my job and started my own company here in the U.S. The goal was to, to establish a company to solve that bottleneck, right? And improve connectivity or bandwidth between space and ground, right? The way we envisioned solving that was by deploying a fully optical network based on geostationary relay satellites, basically because... When you so the existing RF networks distributed all over the planet makes sense, but if you want to go optical, 
and put an optical antenna right next to an RF antenna. It doesn't make any sense. Optical doesn't really compete with RF if you go that way, because basically we all know that you get many, many passes over the poles, and over the poles you get bad weather. So when you factor the weather in, the amount, the capacity of optical distributed ground station network doesn't make any sense. So the way to go is by deploying a small spacecraft in geo that collects data from low Earth orbit satellites and route that information back to ground to suitable locations weather-wise. So basically, could you describe a typical use case? I assume this is, for example, a lot about Earth observation data. Yeah, I, so the network, it's an asymmetric network in which information flows mainly from low Earth orbit back to ground. And that's a particular, the use case, it's mainly for Earth observation companies or that data collection companies, basically also IoT and small spacecraft that are collecting data in low Earth orbit and needs and they need to get that data back to the ground in huge amounts. So but that's that's one that's one use case. That technology, although challenging, let's say that it's easy to deploy. But the next step for the company is to deploy a fully optical network symmetric in which information also flows from ground to space and from space to Earth orbit satellites that can transmit that data using RF systems. So that that's the long-term vision for the company. And you've already briefly touched upon why it doesn't make any sense to just build a lot of ground stations. Now, su suppose one other alternative way would be to just store that data on board. Is that a viable alternative? Or if not, what are the reasons? Is that, for example, about time sensitivity of the data? Yeah, so I think that storing data in space, I don't know if it makes any sense because if when you deploy a, a data transfer network as this, you can get all that information back to ground where, where if you store that information in space, eventually you will have to erase that and get rid of many, many data that perhaps you will be, become valuable in time, right? So, and I think storage in, in orbit makes sense, but again, it consumes power where you put it, you put a constellation in Earth orbit or you, so not sure about that. And let's see how all these technologies come into place. Because in the in the long term, I think it all comes to what the, te the underlying technologies are, right? How the memory will be improved, right? In order to, to be in space without upsets and so forth. So I think right now it makes sense to deploy a relay. I mean, let's say it's equivalent of deploying fiber. It's just transporting data. And for that, really, you already touched upon that you're going to use optical communications rather than radio frequency communications. Because our audience is not entirely technical, could you briefly touch upon the advantages and disadvantages and, and possibly also the challenges of using optical systems rather than radio frequency systems? Yeah. So it all comes to what's the market that we are addressing and how much data we want them or we will provide them as a data transfer network. So as we all know, the internet is running optical through fiber. So an optical comms have already achieved super high speed compared to compared to RF. Particularly I think the, the record is 350 times more. So it's a natural way to go, right? And at the same time, since we are addressing the the small sub market the mo the optical modems that we have to deliver to our customers so that they can access the network need to be really low in swap right size weight and power and the way uh, you yeah to go it's optical because the beam is so narrow so that you can put a lot of data there with minimum power consumption of course there is a catch and the catch is that you need to really point Point really well the the laser beam towards the, the geospacecraft. So that's that's the, the basic challenge behind optical communications in space. It's funny you mentioned um, what you call the narrow beam here. 
or the, the, the tight beam, because it reminds me that uh, in many science fiction novels, actually the communication in space is already happening in an optical way. Uh, most recently, I've noticed it uh, on the Expanse on the TV series. They were talking <laughs> about a, a tight beam communications. <laughs> so yeah. it sounds like your know, life is life is going to imitate art. And I guess exactly. if I'm not mistaken, a couple of follow-up questions on that. One, if I remember correctly, the speed of light in the space vacuum is is even faster than in fiber on Earth, correct? And secondly, this type of system, although commercially it hasn't been deployed a lot, I think governments have already been using in space, right? Yeah, the, the major players in space have been playing around with optical communication technology, particularly Airbus and the Europeans are the most more advanced, commercially speaking. So it's a proven technology. So for us, the main challenge, although we have to build these systems because we build all the optical communication technology in-house, is to deploy and make it commercially available, and particularly for the small sat market, right? So the, the main challenges that we faced is how to make these optical modems that will be installed on our customer cell and really low in swap, right? So that they can use this system. So I think that's the, the most challenging part of our venture is how to proliferate this type of technology or network among this new space industry or small set market. That's kind of touching upon my next question I was going to ask you. So as I mentioned, there hasn't been a lot of commercial use of optical technology, optical communications in space so far. I assume that's because the technology just wasn't there yet. Is the technology there yet today or is there any sort of major, are there any major gaps still in the on, the, on any of the components? So we based our optical communication systems on, let's say, two industries. One is the fiber optics industry, and the other one is LiDAR. So I would say that now, let's say in the past two or five years, the technology has catch up so that op an optical network can improve the amount of data that lower orbit satellite can get back to ground. Basically. What we will, our first deployment, which is scheduled for the second half of 2022, will provide, a, let's say, 100 satellite constellation uh, between 20 and 50 times more data than what they are getting today using RF systems. So I would say that the te technology has catch up. So it's not, a good, it's not a good time to deploy this type of network. Makes sense, commercially speaking. And with the kind of numbers of additional bandwidth that you're talking about here, I mean, that's very different from what we have today. Do you see any sort of use cases for your customers, like, for example, in Earth observation that will get enabled by this, you know, much bigger data pipe that maybe people are not envisioning right now? Yeah. So when I started the company or before, right before I started the company, I always wanted to get my phone and see live video of every major city on the planet. And that's, that was the, the idea, inception, that uh, had me thinking about this optical network. Because in order to do that and get that, let's say, in real time, the only way to go is by deploying a geostationary relay cell. Yeah. So I would say that one application, I don't, I don't really, I cannot see the, the commercial use case. I can see... Uh, so I, I typically use the analogy between GPS and Uber. You know, 20 or 30 years ago, when we were using at the early stages of GPS, commercially speaking, we didn't really use that much, right? It was just about selling the GPS device that we were using on our cars, right? But eventually it led to, yeah, to the, to the advent of Uber and all those new applications that we run on cell phones, right? So I started the, I, the company with the idea of helping our customers, which are lower orbit companies that are taking pictures of the Earth, venture into real-time applications like high-definition video of every major city and planet. Understood. And talking about your customer group, so we've been talking a little bit our, about the Earth observation customers already. Are there any other important customer groups? I mean, do you plan, for example, to cater to the governments, governments worldwide as well? Yeah, of course. Governments, uh, I think it's still a huge part of the ecosystem. 
although many, many companies are trying to push the boundaries of space commerce, I, I see the government playing, still playing a huge role in sustaining this industry. But on top of the Earth observation and IoT markets or players, along the way doing customer discovery over the last three years, I understood or I've been yeah, approached by the internet side constellations or companies that are applying to provide connectivity from space or using satellites that optical communication technology is an underlying technology for them to be successful. So there is a lot of traction from that market as well, right? But I don't see them at first using the geo-relay because it's, a, let's say, an asymmetric network. But I see them connecting their satellites, uh, making a mesh in lower orbit so that they can relay data from pretty far away locations to gateways to internet gateways. So, and that's where I see our, our second type of product, which is Leo Leo Crosslink, playing a major role here. Well, Leo Leo Crosslink, that's actually a very interesting topic you bring up. Because if I'm not mistaken, all of the communications mega constellations, so that's namely uh, SpaceX, so Starlinks, Amazon, Skyper, and then well, I suppose at least until recently, one web, and we have to see how that situation develops. Yeah, we're our potential customer for this type of of laser link, correct? Correct, exactly. So until we deploy the geo network, I see the use case of onboarding optical crosslink technology, something that it's uh, really important for this emerging satellite constellation, right? Because you know, they need to move data, right, uh, in order to, yeah, to connect people in pretty far away locations and get those that data back to the internet so that they can close the loop. And I suppose another question on this, if you have a LEO network, communications networks that's using these laser links, and again, keeping in mind that the speed of light is, uh, is faster in, in vacuum, does that ultimately mean that if you have a big enough distance for, say, a phone call or data transmission, that this transmission is going to happen faster than than current alternatives, whether they be terrestrial or, or in space? Yeah, but there is a catch to that. I think optical transmission in free space okay. compared to fiber, I think it's 10 milliseconds in difference or something like that. It's pretty narrow. So the main challenge to, for the free space optica in lower orbit to beat the fiber connectivity is how fast you can handshake two satellites in orbit. And that's the main challenge in optical cons, particularly when you are, yeah, when you are switching from satellite to satellite in less than, I don't know, you need a couple of seconds for that handshake to occur. Yes, I'm of course not an expert in optical communications. How should one envision that? Is that that you need to handshake for every communication that is happening? Or is there anything like a, let's say, like a standing link between satellites? Yeah, but imagine you want to connect you want to connect New York with London, right? So the way to go is that there is a there is a satellite that is flying over London and there is another one flying over New York. They are collecting data or want to transfer data from there to the other place, but they are they there is a limited amount of time which those spacecraft are flying over those locations. So, and that's and that's the the, the handshake that needs to occur, right? Because then it comes another satellite that is flying over those cities and over and over again. So it's always a handshake, and that's because of the nature of lower orbit or lower orbits compared to yeah to the ground, right? And I suppose another thing is which we haven't touched upon yet. In contrast to radio frequency communications, unless I'm mistaken, optical communications are not regulated at all, correct? Correct, yeah. So not for in-space connectivity. If you're transferring data from space to ground, yes. I don't, I'm don't. i not really sure that you need a license. Actually, I'm pretty sure that you don't need it, but you need to inform that you are beaming through the atmosphere, particularly to the FAA. There is no regulation in place. I would say that because of two reasons. The one, the first one is there. There are many optical links in space. We are not getting interference from other players. And the second one is because the beam is so narrow that uh, you won't be beaming out 
liked all over the place. So that's the second reason. But I, as this technology or type of communication proliferates, I see a need for regulation, of course. And because, as you mentioned, the beam is so narrow, does that actually also mean that it's more secure than radio frequency communications? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, let's say that. Our, so the beam, the footprint of the beam in Geo from Leo, it's about a kilometer. So it's super narrow. So in order to, for yeah, a third party to capture that data, it will have to be within that, that area, which is super narrow. So you'll figure out that there is, there is someone or interfering with the beam or pretty close by to you in order to capture that data. And changing tack a little bit. So keeping in mind your, your customer groups that we talked about, and I'm now referring to the, the, re, the data relay services side of the business and not so much the, the optical transceiver equipment sales. How do you think about the market size here in five years, 10 years? So the way I see the space industry is to, for the space industry to really become something else, and that's the promise that we've been hearing over the last decade, is that there, there are four or five different type of technology or services that need to come at the right place in the right time. And that's the launch cost needs to go down. Elon is doing a great job there. Satellites need to, to be more cost-effective, smaller. Then we need a data transfer network so that those guys can get that data back to the ground. And let's imagine that their business case or the, or the revenue opportunity behind every single one of those companies is proportional to the amount of the information that they will bring back to the ground. They need more connectivity, right? Right now, the space industry has a cap on that. And I, I, I believe that that's a huge inefficiency that is uh, impeding the space industry to blossom. And this, this, the third one is the AI, how to monetize all that data and fast, fast computing. So when all those pieces of technology infrastructure come in place, I see the industry boosting or enlarging, right? A, a, a huger market that, that is foreseen on that Morgan Stanley $1 trillion economy. That's for the entire space space sector, $1 trillion. Yeah, for memory, by 20, 2030 or 2040. Yeah. Speaking about, you mentioned AI and data processing. Um, I forgot to ask you, various people have various opinions on sort of the amount of in-space data processing that could or should take place in the future. Obviously, currently, there's, there's almost none. Do you have a view on that? I, I mean... Data storage in space and computing makes sense if no one's no one deploys the network infrastructure, right? It's what we've seen uh, over the last 20 years on our personal computers. You know, we had our hard drives uh, 15 uh, years ago, and now everything is on the cloud. So the amount of data that we store on our computer is limited or, or little. And I see that. But you know that there was a huge boost in connectivity on the ground so that we can use the cloud. I see the same situation in space, right? Yeah. And that's why we're working on that in order to boost connectivity so that our customers don't need to store that information in space for a limited amount of time, right? So yeah, that's my take on that. You already talked a little bit about where you see the company going in the long term of having the year to the, basically the data, the fully optical data relay, relay network symmetrically and both directions set up. What are some of your immediate milestones in the near term? So what we're doing right now in the company, we are developing four products or systems. We're developing optical crosslink technology for in-plane connectivity in low Earth orbit. We are developing low data rate systems and super high data rate systems. And then on top of that, what we've been doing over the past two years is developing the most exquisite piece of technology uh, at Skylon, which is the optical receiving technology in GEO, which has a, a huge challenge in order to overcome the inefficiencies of laser light injection. And on top of that, we are developing the, the optical modem to access that geostationary relay 
technology as well. So the, the, the immediate milestone for the company is to roll out this product that we call Kinser, which is the low data rate optical modem for our customers in Lower Thobic to connect their cell at different. And that should occur in the next four months. And yeah, we'll be flying on top of one customer satellite uh, this optical system that will prove that we can achieve high data rates at the size and, uh, and weight and power that we envision these products to be. Okay. And could you talk a little bit about the background of the team and how you guys found each other initially? Yeah, sure. So I started the company with Santiago, Tim Point. Santiago was a colleague of mine back at Inbap, where we used to work developing geostationary imaging satellites. And we had this idea of, of starting our own company and because we, we both come from families that own their business. And because of our passion in space, it was a natural step for us to, to start our own company and stay in this industry. The rest of the team, I don't know, it's, uh, it's part of the journey. You talk building these companies from the ground up. You talk to many, many people. Some, some people believe in you, some others don't. And we were lucky enough to, to put together a team that is basically coming from the space industry, let's say traditional, uh, building RF systems, synthetic aperture radars, high-speed electronics, and so forth. So we were lucky enough to build a team, not only with people that we didn't know, but also with former colleagues of ours and friends that believed in us bringing this company to this, to this point. As you mentioned that Santiago and yourself, you came from INVAP. INVAP, if I remember correctly, is basically the satellite integrator in Argentina, where I believe you are from. Now, I was recently at the, the satellite conference in DC, and there was a panel on Latin America, and somebody referred to Latin America as the, the sleeping giant in space. <laughs> and I suppose part of the reason is that, um, and some people may not be aware of this, there's actually quite a lot of aeronautical, astronautical um, talent, engineering talent, countries like Brazil and, and Argentina. How do you see that, Marcus? Well, I mean, there is talent. I think talent is universal, but it's the opportunities within those countries that make that, that talent really yeah, shine. And INVAP and other companies like Sallogic, for instance, and others in Brazil as well, and other countries, gave the opportunity to a small group of people because we're talking that Imbab, it's a yeah, 1,500 people company. It's not that large, right? So, yeah, I think those companies, all those small, give people the opportunity to, to develop in these type of technologies that uh, for some of us are, yeah, true, true passion. I think there is still... Yeah, years and decades of continuous work in order to make that giant uh, wake up, you know. We're keeping our fingers crossed. As you know, yeah. I'm also spending a lot of time in, um, in Brazil. Yeah. Now, you, you guys um, decided in the end, though, to base the company out of the U.S. Was that just because you guys were already based there or was that driven, for example, by other considerations like customers or capital availability or the like? Yeah, it's all about the customers, but also about the how important it pays for the U.S., you know? And I think that it's the underlying hypothesis upon which we decided to start the company here in the U.S. It's because it's important here. Uh, many other countries, although they like space technology or they want to venture into space tech, satellites, and so forth, I don't see them realizing the true value behind that industry, yeah, and how far it pushes innovation and development. But that's the main reason why we started the company here in the U.S. And of course, part of that fact that space is very important in the U.S. then is, I suppose, capital availability. And you guys are a, a venture-funded company already, and I think you're going into another fundraising round right now. I'm curious, you guys are a little bit on the, what I'd call like the, the deep tech end 
of space. I mean, there's certainly other space business models which are, you know, uh, easier to understand for the average person. You know, like if it's uh, data only, Earth observation, for example. How have you found the conversations with investors? How much of a uh, obstacle is the um, the technical understanding, if any at all? Yeah, tricky question. I I would say that it depends on. So you know, raising capital, it's all about talking to many many people, and eventually you you'll be in front of the right person or the right venture fund that will invest in you. So it's all about funding those people, right? And it's not a, when you find those people, it's not a, a complex conversation. And particularly because of, of our background, developing similar technologies, they, they trust that we can deliver. Although this is challenging, challenging because we are developing not fundamental technologies, but complex systems, right? So, yeah, I wouldn't say that it's tough. It's all about getting in front of the right people at the right moment. Since we are recording this in times of the um, coronavirus epidemic, have you seen any impacts um, in, in customers, in investors, and in any of the other people you interact with in the space sector? So, yeah, what I've, I've heard that people are more cautious about their investment, but when when some other investors invested during the this crisis so i raised uh, around 3 weeks ago and they just yeah it depends on the investor they some investors see investing in, let's say deep deep tech companies particularly moving or uh, working on the telecommunications arena to be the right bet you know what i mean we all rely on connectivity right now that we are home officing. So some investors see this as the next step. So they think that this is, let's say, a quality uh, investment. And you've clearly uh, found a very interesting gap to fill in the market from, from what we heard before. Now, nevertheless, we always ask this question uh, to all of our guests. If you didn't do what you're doing right now at Skyloom, if you, you know, were to start any other space business, is there something in particular in particular that would interest you? Tough question, Rafael. <laughs> I don't know. It was when I when I came with this idea, it was just this idea, you know. And um, no, not really. That's, that's fine. <laughs> it's good. It's 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 good to be focused. There's something to be said if you know you have the right idea, and then also if you are the right team to execute it. Exactly. There's absolutely yeah. absolutely nothing wrong with that. So we'll go to <laughs> yeah. the other we we'll go to the other question we always ask, sure. which is you know obviously this is a space podcast, so we always ask, are you a science fiction fan? That's usually a resounding yes. And and, and by the way, you know I have noticed that some of your I think maybe all of your spacecraft, um, if I remember correctly, are named after. Star Trek characters. <laughs> so yeah. I suppose that also uh, tells us something. Are you a sci-fi yeah. fan? And if yes, what are your favorite books, movies, TV series? I'm a huge movie fan. I would say that I'm, I'm a Star Wars fan, not a, a Star Trek fan. Although I realized that Star Trek names or characters were more or easy to map with our technology. You know, Uhura, it's the communications commander. Scotty, it's beam me up. So they are beaming information up from lower Thorby to Geo. Kinser, it's Scotty's uh, sidekick. And that's why Kinser and Scotty have so much in common in product wise. But yeah, I would say that, yeah, I'm a science fiction fan. I'm really fond of great movies like Star Wars and others like Interstellar. That's the, that's a huge movie. And particularly back when I was 15 years old, It was, this was 1994, 1995. My father took me to the movies and we watched Apollo 13. And that was the moment in which I realized that I would be spending my whole professional career developing spacecraft and space technology. Oh, that's interesting. So it was the mission that went wrong that inspired you to get into space. <laughs> yeah, but not because it went wrong. It was, I don't know, back in the day, it was the only, yeah, I, it was the first time that I was exposed to the Apollo missions. I didn't know anything about them before watching that movie. And when I was watching that movie, it was amazing to be able to, to participate in such a challenging project with such a romantic nature, right? Touching the moon. And that hooked me, you know? It was about 
going to the moon, you know, and putting this unique piece of technology and many, many people working together to, to accomplish something truly amazing. And on, on that note, I truly hope that very soon we'll have, we'll extend your optical network to the moon, to Mars, maybe to the asteroids, who knows, because that's really where it makes, seems to make sense to have optical communications as well. Marcus, exactly. thank you so much for doing this. All the best for the company, all the best with your upcoming uh, product launches and the fundraising. Awesome, Rafael. Thanks for having me. Take care. Godspeed. That's it for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider giving it a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Also consider supporting the podcast at www patreon.com forward slash space business podcast if you have any feedback including ideas for guests and that may include yourself if you have an exciting space story to tell or are interested in being a sponsor or really anything else drop us an email at space business podcast at gmail.com that's it i look forward to seeing you for the next episode <laughs>